Can you show me flat hands? In rocks? Yeah. I can apple. Yeah. I can apple. Yeah. One. Oh, I just farted. Okay, you gotta smile. And then it's over, I promise. Daddy farted. Can you look at the camera? Daddy did. October 2019, I was pregnant with Jackson. So here's baby number five. And it was actually in this room. And you know when you're pregnant and everything just feels sore and I don't know, literally just went like, and I felt a little lump. And I went to appointments and they kept saying, it could be a block t you know, um, milk duct or hormone related or whatever. It kept getting brushed off until I went to my GP. And she's the first one who said to me, let's get this ultrasound. I want a second opinion. I want this looked at. We did all that. And I said, look, honestly, I'm pregnant. I don't want to do anything now. Let's just sit on this because you never expect a cancer diagnosis. That's everyone, oh, it's probably just nothing, is all you ever hear. And I let it go. And then just December that year, it had tripled in size. Got it all biopsied. And I remember sitting in there and the breast care nurse came out to me. And she sat down and before the surgeon even walked into the room, she said, have you got a support person out in the waiting room? <laughs> what for? And then he came in and he sat down and he said, it's cancer. That was the very first moment. I was numb. Completely numb, I just, I was five months pregnant at the stage and um, another oncologist had to come in and they had to explain to me that they need to go away now and have a discussion about how to approach this because in the 30 years at this hospital, there's only been three pregnant women and I'm the third. So they needed to go away and have consult everyone and then get back to me about the what to do. That afternoon they sent me to this appointment, this appointment, I need bloods, I need this done, I need ultrasounds done. But that was the start of the week. By that Friday, I was in the chemo chair. They did keep using the word early breast cancer. So they kept saying it's early breast cancer, it's early, it's this, it's localised, is what they kept saying. It wasn't until I had my surgery that I found out it was stage two triple negative. And my main focus was the baby. So they assured me that if I went through the four rounds of the AC chemo, studies around the world have shown that it just, it didn't affect a baby in the womb. So that was their plan, to try and shrink the tumor as much as they could before surgery. I had extra scans for the baby, extra appointments. And then COVID hit. That was another thing that I had to face was, now I've got to go through treatment of this new diagnosis on my own. So they gave me the four weeks off from treatment. I was about 36 weeks pregnant. They induced me to have the baby. All went well, was beautiful. When he was two weeks old and they started me on another lot of chemo for a bit, he came with me into the hospital. The nurses loved him. The other patients loved seeing the tiny little baby come in. And he was my support person, my little support buddy, through, I think I made it through six rounds of that Taxol chemo. I was able to apply for a, a child wellbeing exemption for the kids to still go to childcare and uh, school. They could understand that mummy needed medicine. So they knew when it came time to that I was going to lose all my hair, it, started, it was coming out in clumps and I got the kids to shave it. They did it for me, I had to get them involved. The only reason they stopped that chemo was because I was getting the neuropathy in my fingers. It's where all the numbness and tingling in the fingers. And because I had a newborn, 
and I couldn't do up his little zippy you know, buttons on his suit. I couldn't do anything, or they they like, nah, let's just stop this chemo and we'll go straight to surgery. It was a hard time to have appointments and be alone. It was a hard time. It was a good outcome, very pleased with what. And they wanted me to go on an oral chemo for six months, just as an insurance policy mop up, whatever. This was after the radiation. So they threw everything they had at me. I couldn't do the oral chemo. I tried a couple of times, but yeah, my body just didn't react to it. I couldn't get up, I couldn't work. I was sick. I couldn't function my normal day to day. We tried a couple of times to reduce the dose of the tablets, have a break, it still wasn't working. So the oncologist made the decision, she's like, you've done everything you could, let's just stop it and we'll observe you from now on. A lot of these appointments were now phone cons, no, on the phone now, because lockdowns. And because they had removed the cancer, I don't know, the hospital probably thought that they didn't need to physically see me anymore because we we're good, so everything was fine. My biggest fear was what if it came back and they didn't catch it in time. That was what kept me awake a lot of nights. They, no evidence of disease was in the reports. They, yeah, they didn't feel the need to see me face to face. If anything didn't feel right, then let them know. But we're just touching base for my appointments. Because I was always thought that cancer spread through the lymph nodes. That's how I always thought until I found out recently that this one spreads through the blood. And they kept saying to me, hey, any lumps and bumps? Oh, I'm checking religiously everything. Kept plotting along, having my appointments. There's no, no lumps, we're, we're good. Um, then they said, yeah, we're still, you know, your yearly mammograms and ultrasounds are good. In my breast cancer wasn't hormone driven or anything. Triple negative, having another baby shouldn't affect this. I said to one of my appointments, I said, I wanna start trying for baby number six. They said, yeah, okay. If I feel well in myself, then the doctors are giving me the, you know, all clear and I went in and I saw the surgeon and I said, look, I'm early pregnant with a baby and they said they were confident they'll see me in a year. I went to my appointments, I saw the doctors, I felt sick. So the entire time of the pregnancy, like vomiting and the pain wouldn't go away and I only put on like one, 1 1.8 kilos the whole pregnancy. And then he was induced at 40 weeks. He was a big baby, fine. There was no reason for concerns. He was born January the 8th, 2023. I saw my oncologist. She wanted to see me initially before the baby was born to double check this pain that I had but there was no appointments, couldn't get me in. So it was January when they could get me in after the baby was born. And I said to her, look, the pain's still in. I was getting short of breath. I was having a, I was starting to cough. I think deep down, I knew something wasn't right, but I was under the impression that if I didn't have a lump in the breast, then the cancer wasn't back. And I always had it in the back of my head, reoccurrence. Not good. Reoccurrence is not good. So I was checking religiously all the time, constantly checking. Because I thought, it will start here. If there was anything, it'll be here. So she ordered a PET scan and she called me in. I could just tell the vibe of the room. It was, it wasn't good. Yeah, she said to me, it had spread. It was in, in too many places now. And she, she's telling me, it's spread to too many places. It's now terminal. It is gonna cut my life short now. It's in the ribs, because I could feel the pain. It's in the lungs, because I couldn't breathe. She didn't say much more than that. She just let me process. I had the breast care nurse come in, because 
I had Cooper, who was four weeks old, in the room with me. Cooper's there, and he's starting to stir a little. So the breast Curtis is, she's comforting him. And I tried calling the husband, and I got the oncologist to speak to him on the phone, and she told him, it's not good, it's terminal. Just tests need to be done. And that, and she's like, it's less than two years with treatment, with treatment. Because eventually these treatments will stop working and we will run out of options because of the type of cancer it is. So she's, and then I saw her again a week after, then when she got all her results back, Ken came with me to speak to her because this was a big, big thing. And she said, it confirmed it was the triple negative breast cancer that's back, that she's already booked me in for my chemo, that we have to start the chemo straight away. And Ken's asking, you know, oh, is there any uh, clinical trials or any of this sort of stuff that we can try? And she's like, at this stage, I'm too sick to try any of that. We need to start chemo. And I've got my superannuation forms and all that to fill out to try and get that early release. Because I can't work. I couldn't work. All this has gone around in my head and everything you need to try and get things into motion. Her words were, I was too sick. Too sick is what she just kept saying. But yeah, sure, I had pain. I, yeah, I knew this pain. So she prescribed me the pain medication and some steroids and to treat the symptoms. She's treat, uh, and I've walked away with all these scripts for all this medication that I needed. Now we're just treating the symptoms. We're just trying to give, make you comfortable and give you time with the kids. I thought I felt numb the first time around. This, this one is numb. The, my main focus was how do we tell the kids? So we went to the school. I had to tell the school so they can start putting things into you know, motion for the kids. We got into, you know, can't cancel, the local services, just to see what support was out there to try and help us through this time. I thought so many times about how to tell them. Like, do, you, do you tell them this much? Do you tell them that much? Do you not tell them? What, what did, what do you tell them? And I came to the honesty. You know, now that they're a bit older and they've experienced me being sick that time around, they're older now, I need to be honest with what's, what's going to happen. I'm not going to give them the whole truth right now, but enough for them to express their emotions at this stage. And then as we progress, I'm going to tell them the truth so I can help them and grieve with them and whatever they need to do the process before the inevitable, whenever that happens, that I've given it, I've given what I could to the kids to help them, you know, go beyond this now. We went outside, sat at the table outside, and told the three older ones, Matthew, Caden, and Mia. Now, Matthew's now nine, Caden's seven, and Mia's now six. And told them that mummy's sick again. And like last time, it's, it's cancer. They asked them if they knew what cancer was, and I told them that I'm going to get very, very sick. They're going to see me get very, very sick. I told them, even though they might not understand at this present time, and there's a lot to take in, that they, it's okay to feel what they feel. They can feel angry, they can feel upset, they can feel whatever they want, whatever they need to feel, they can. But don't dwell on that feeling. Matthew asked me, am I going to die? And I said, yes. Didn't tell him when. Didn't. Don't know when. No one knows. 
and it was probably within the last week that Matthew has actually asked, said to me, is Cooper still gonna be a baby when you die? I said, it's a very good chance, Matthew, probably. He goes, will Cooper be a teenager? I said, I don't think we're gonna be that lucky, but we'll try. But I think it's just been in the last couple of weeks, Matthew's, the oldest, has now got an idea of how soon these things are going to start happening. You're even watching the piggies? Okay, you know, no. If Kaden understands she's sick, she has had that she has it, but but not what it means. Like, yeah. I don't keep to myself. I'm so low. It's hard. Will, will, will you go wings? Eventually. Huh. And like in heaven, and you, you'll get uh, wings. Eventually. And those things around. A halo, eventually. Yeah. And she, and she'll look like a baby on top with those spears, those little cupids. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> If that's what you want to picture it? Yeah. Then <laughs> you can picture it that way. It is starting to be that harsh reality, realisation now. It's, even though I still feel, I'm still, <laughs> still feel good. And the breast care nurse and the oncologist, and they said, yeah, I am, I'm doing really good. I, there is going to come time where I'm not. It will come. I'm a dog groomer. I'll just take the kids to school, do my dogs, and I'll be a machine going through all this stuff. I want to keep going, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to take a big step back because I've got appointments and I can't, I can't commit to. But you know, dog grooming was 16 years of my life, and I find myself. You know, even when I'm scrolling on Facebook and I see other people's, what they do with their home grooming salons, and I'm like, what, oh, I really, I want to do that. And then it's, yep, I remember now. Or, oh, you know, we drive down this road and there's a high school. Oh yeah, I want to do a tour of that high school. And then I'm, yeah, it's a bit thinking too far ahead. But my mind's still, I feel that well in my, you know, mentally, emotionally, in myself, that I'm still making plans for years ahead. And then I've got to be snapped back to, yeah, I remember. This is, oh, no, probably not gonna happen. The honest truth is I'm really struggling when I have the bad days. And I know I haven't had many of them, but when I do have them, and I can't, and I feel sick, or I just lay on the couch and I find myself dozing off a lot. I'm so hard on myself because I feel that that's progression. I feel that that's me getting worse. And then I find myself getting a bit negative about it all because I feel, well, is this the start of me going downhill? So I went to have treatment yesterday and they said that my bloods weren't looking too good and you're gonna not have any chemo until you see your oncologist on the 19th, and then she's gonna make your next plan. I've already been told there's not many treatment options for me, and if that's my first line, done and dusted, I'm running out of options quickly and I don't want to. That's my, that's my fear that's sitting there now. Even though I'm still I'm fine, still. We are talking the public system, so it is what they're going to offer. I remember she said that I didn't need to tell the kids straight away because it'll be a few weeks before I start looking sick. Six months in now, down the track, that everyone's still telling me I still look well and they expected me to look sicker. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but um, they expect me to be sicker. So I'm waiting, trying to organise a second opinion for Peter Mac. Maybe there's another specialist out there who's willing to take more risks if you... Because if 
my medical team don't think something's worth taking that risk because of the percentage of it working nothing. Who's to say that another doctor might think that it's worth doing? When I first met Susan, she's in the comedy. I used to make her laugh and then she got, she got sick of all the comedy the whole time. So now it's hard to make her laugh, but it makes me try even more. Uh, they say if you laugh every day, you'll increase your days. Yeah. I think you just got to laugh. She always thinks that I'm uh, not serious. I, I, I do hear it. I, I do take the seriousness of it. But uh, you got to attach comedy to it or positivity to it. But it is that extra support. So even if he doesn't want to talk about it, I can still vent away of how I'm feeling, if I'm feeling angry, or if I have a little moments or little thoughts that I'm upset, you know, I'm not going to be able to see the kids do this, then I can just say how I'm feeling. Whether or not I think you're listening. Mm. She goes, are you even listening? Did you hear and what I said? And I repeat said? everything back. I was just thinking that. Yeah. we got this telepathic thing where we think of the same thing. I can hear. See, I might be watching TV, but I can hear. We're okay financially. Uh, it's not bad. But it doesn't help when you got to live day to day. We don't have a mortgage, but um, we if we rent. did, we, we do pay rent. So uh, we are okay at the moment, but it's not gonna, the money's not going to last. last. Let's say... Uh, inflation and whatever else, the guy has to sell this house. We sit there and we think, how are we going to rent or go for another house? Six kids. So um, the chances of getting it, well, we've got a perfect record in rentals, but um, would we get it? Not the way it is now. There's no, there's no stability in renting. In renting, and that's, yeah. And that's all rentals. There's no stability at all. You never know. If he wants to sell it, sell it, move back in, you got no, no choice. No, no choice. You got to go. And the way renting is at the moment. And if he's got to still pay a mortgage up on this, and he has to sell it because he can't afford it, well, there's nothing we can do. If you weren't, if we weren't paying rent, you could easily get a motel or something like that but it's not going to be how you're going to save up to get your rent again I'm stressing because I'm looking at that money dwindle away and I try on my good days and when I can I try to groom some dogs just to get some money in to buy groceries that week because it's just not happening it's hard. And then I know there's food banks and there's um, local communities with their pantries and all. It's just, when you go in there and you try and get enough food to feed eight people in the house, you look greedy. It's hard. I've made it known, I've made myself known to the local you know, people trying to help. But it's just, it's hard. I don't go to it. He won't. So it's gotta be me. I won't even walk into a salvos. He's going to have to, isn't he? He's you're going to yeah. have to. Sometimes I wish he'd be more open to talk to me about you know, things that we need to talk about. As much as he doesn't want to think about what's going to happen, conversations need to be had, and they will have to be had. I'm worried about how he's going to deal after the fact that he's going to need to open up to someone. He has to. You can't just let it bring you down. So there are, I've got concerns. You just can't keep burying your head in the sand and pretend it's not gonna happen. But he does. I'm gonna have to deal with the fact that the children are gonna lose their mother. Uh, I will be positive for the children, same way that I'm positive with her. So we remember the good times with Susan, not, not the bad times, so. If you dwell on negativity, it's going to be bringing that into your life. So it really depends on the situation, but if you approach it in a positive way, you will come out with a positive outcome, I believe. It, it was getting a bit much, having both the chemos. So they're keeping me on just the gem side of being on its own. 
but then you speak to uh, you know a different medical person oh no we, we we won't go back to that we're just going to I, d- I don't get why we stop lines of treatments when we know they're working and there's been no progression so far anywhere else so I don't understand the decisions to stop lines of treatment if they're working to switch to a different one it's hard to tell whether the decision making behind these lack of options is is it government funded is it financial reasoning it's hard to tell if I went private would there be different options available for me I do what I get told to do by my medical team I get told these are your options this is what we are doing this is what we feel is best for you it's hard to understand the reasoning behind these I feel like I've got a lot of fight left in me I feel am I too far advanced am I too far gone that nothing is just going to give me more time why is it only certain people that can access certain medicines that's what I don't get that is the hardest part is one life not worth it like my life not worth it or is it the fact that no matter what they do they could throw everything at me it's not going to change a thing I don't know what I get from my appointments is I'm probably too far gone it's probably not going to do anything for me it's probably not going to change but why can't we try I feel like I'm going to keep going until until my last breath I'm still going to keep fighting the same fight so I feel if there is a chance something could work even if everyone is around going oh no 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 it might not work might not work no choice well can we try I might surprise you my medical team is well aware of where I stand they are well aware that I'll take anything that is offered to me I don't have the time to sit and wait for you know so there was a woman that I've been doing treatment with and we bonded about our fears and the unknown together and she unfortunately passed away yesterday. When you go to that appointment and that's what they say is there's nothing else, there's physically no more options we can give you that we can just make you comfortable now to the end, that is my bit, that's, but I don't even know. I, she was told she was out of op- treatment options six to eight weeks ago and she passed away a couple of days ago now. My life might not mean much to the hospital. I might just be another patient. My life might not mean much to the government. But to my kids, to my six little kids, I'm everything. I'm the world to them. And I'm proud and I just want them to be good people. <laughs> Coming. I'm always going to be here for them. I'm always here. They're not alone. It's going to be okay. I need to be there to comfort my kids. I need to be there to protect them. And I'm not. We found this book that I'm going to spend the next few months or, you know, just writing answers for my kids so they know who I am what advice would you give your eight-year-old self tell me what what you do when you can't sleep what is the cause that you feel passionate about what was your favorite thing to do to pick up your spirits when you felt down I think that's there are so many women who have got the triple negative and they're scared and you're not alone And I'm hoping by putting more light on this triple negative breast cancer, there's going to be more options. The people are going to put the time and the effort into and there'll be more options for this. The second reason is more of a selfish reason that I've got something to leave behind for my kids. So my kids can watch this back and they can see what what I'm going through, what I've done, that I've got some sort of legacy that I want to help other women, but also I want them to remember me, how I, how I am.
I don't think about it. About you leaving me. I don't know who I'd be. We just fall into each other's arms. And we laugh and we cry and we dry each other's eyes. We don't think about it. About you.